thank you for joining us tonight. I want to thank Ellen Dean for inviting me to speak along with Dr. Wittig. Tonight, uh, my charge was to talk about developmental dysplasia of the hip. And I emphasize developmental dysplasia of the hip. You can see the citation here back in 1989, which is a year number to me because that's when I finished my fellowship. It used to be called congenital dislocation of the hip. So in 30 years, developmental dysplasia of the hip really hasn't changed too much, except there's more literature to support what we knew 30 years ago. And so I'll take you back to uh, 30 years ago when I uh, started, as with Dr. Harkey, who developed hip ultrasound. And I also had Dr. Mubarak come out uh, to DuPont to learn ultrasound. And I became friends with him. And he became a leader in the field of hip ultrasound and hip dysplasia. And uh, Peter Pizzatello, also from Jefferson, was down at DuPont uh, and gave us lectures on all the various osteotomies of the hip. And I thought I knew everything at the end of my fellowship. Little did I know, nothing too much was going to change over the last 30 years. And uh, now we have a lot of reasoning why we do what we do. So what is dislocation of the hip? It's really three types. There's developmental dysplasia of the hip, and that's my charge today. There's neuromuscular and teratogenic, which we'll not be speaking about today. The incidence still has not changed too much. The dislocated hip, where it's dislocated about one in a thousand births. The dislocatable hip, where it's located to be dislocated about one in a thousand births. And then there's this fuzzy, subluxable hip that's sometimes moving and not. And that's been defined a little bit better now to uh, those hips that are still moving at about six weeks of life. And you'll see why in a moment. And that has to do with relaxing hormones and estrogen uh, that the child has uh, from the placenta. Again, first female breach is the most common uh, history that you hear. It's more common on the left side than the right. It's bilateral 20% of the time. And as Dr. Sirach had mentioned, uh, torticollis is present with it, about 20% of the patients, and metatarsoductus in about 10% of the patients. So anytime you see a child who has metatarsoductus <clears throat> or torticollis, you always have to think of hip dysplasia. As far as the etiologies goes, genetics plays a role, <clears throat> hormonal influences, and mechanical. But genetics, we know that as a child, if a child has hip dysplasia, the next child or a first degree relative has a 10 times greater risk of having hip dysplasia. So instead of one in a thousand risk, it becomes one in a hundred. And subsequently, if you have two, it goes to 10 times 10. So it becomes 10% 10, 10 chance of having hip dysplasia on the second child. As far as hormonal influence, the placenta gives off estrogen and relaxin, and these are hormones that allow for the placenta, for the um, womb to accommodate birthing, and it also allows for the uh, child to have a less dramatic birthing process, but it also allows the hip joint to be more lax, and if you're in certain positions, to make the hip more lax and dislocatable and subluxable. So specifically the breech presentation. This is a netter's classic picture where you could see the child tucked in. And you can imagine trying to put yourself in this position, the stress that the hip joint has posteriorly. And this can cause a dysplasia or a stretching of the hip capsule. And this will predispose the child to having hip dysplasia in a subluxable hip or a dislocated hip. The associated disorders, as we discussed, is torticollis, and it's a fixed torticollis. And again, this has to do with packaging. That's why it's more likely in the firstborn. And then associated disorders is metatarsoductus. And be fixed metatarsoductus is what you'd be concerned about. What's the diagnosis? How do you diagnose this? Well, physical exam, when you look at the Ortolani and Barlow, which we'll discuss in a moment, it's only in most studies will become into 45% accurate, meaning that if a child actually has a hip dysplasia, that it could be picked up on physical exam only about 45% of the time. The issue with this, though, is it's all comers. So it's the novice and it's the trained pediatric orthopedist. So depending on whose hands it's in, the accuracy goes up dramatically. But not all hips are picked up, and there is silent hip dysplasia, too, and that we'll talk about in a moment on why we screen certain hips, even when you don't feel anything on clinical exam. At six weeks is when it's recommended to do ultrasound. Some people go down at four weeks, but the reason for six weeks is at six weeks, the relaxing hormones that we spoke about and the estrogen are no longer in the child's system. And so if a hip is actually subluxable and lax at that point, 
it's due to the laxity of the child's hip, not related to the hormonal influence of the mother's placenta. And then at six months of life is when we use x-rays. We try not to use x-rays before that because before six months of age, femoral heads are not ossified. So the ultrasound is very good, as you'll see in a moment, at delineating the structures of the hip joint. At six months, the ultrasound is no longer effective because the femoral heads become ossified, and once they become ossified, the ultrasound no longer can capture the acetabulum because the ossified femoral head blocks the acetabulum. So these are the two classic maneuvers that were taught. One is the Ortolani sign, and this is where you abduct the hip and put anterior pressure, and what you're trying to do is reduce the hip. You always do that first because the hip is dislocated. You'll see that if you try to dislocate a dislocated hip, you won't feel anything. So you always do the Ortolani to try to relocate the hip first. And it's also important to determine if the hip is dislocated initially because that makes for a worse prognosis. Then you have the Barlow where you adduct, adduct the hip and you put posterior pressure and you try to dislocate the hip. And it's important to understand that when these were, these, uh, signs were translated from Italian. It was actually a clunk and it was translated un unfortunately as a click, but this is a tactile sensation. And I believe that there are some of the uh, residents who I trained out there who are attending now, may remember when I brought you to the uh, newborn nursery and made you at all different times of the day do this maneuver and expressed how important it was to feel a clunk and not the click. So what's the safe zone that everybody talks about? It's important to understand the safe zone the safe zone actually is the zone in which the femoral head will seat safely in the acetabulum. And it helps from a prognostic standpoint. A safe zone that's small, you can get the hip located, but it's much more difficult to keep the hip located, and you have to watch these children much more closely than a child who has a larger safe zone. And it's also safer as far as the vascular structures and the neurological structures when trying to treat with the babylacarnus. So what are the signs and what happens if you actually don't pick this up at birth? Well, by three months of age, you start getting hip contractures and you have limited abduction. And what, needs, what you need to understand is that at three months of age, if you have a bilateral limited abduction, you potentially have missed a bilateral hip dislocation. So it's very important not to just look for the unilateral asymmetry of the hips, but actually see if it's within normal range. And then there's the galliazid sign, and where you'll see that the one uh, tibia is a little bit shorter than the other, which is actually a mispre misperception of the issue. It's actually the femoral head is dislocated, so the femur is apparently short, which makes it look like one tibia is shorter than the other. And you do this by aligning the two feet together. And you can see here where one leg appears shorter than the other. The asymmetric skin folds are controversial. If you have a true dislocation that's gross, you'll see this. But if you see legs which are generally symmetric and you see asymmetric skin folds, it would suggest that it's not really related to hip dysplasia, but it's always best to have it checked out. Now, when you look at the anatomy of the hips, you can see that the femoral heads should be nicely tucked into, let's see if this uh, shows, but you can see here the femoral head is nicely tucked into the normal acetabulum. Here's the labrum, and here's a dislocated hip, and you can see that the labrum is now uh, in, in, uh, involved with the acetabulum, preventing the femoral head from coming back. And you can do an orthogram which shows that the inverted labrum is here and the ligamentum teri is a, a filling defect. And this helps to you, a surgeon to evaluate how bad the hip is and whether you're going to have to you be able to do a closed reduction or you have to do an open reduction. And that goes beyond the scope of the indications for surgery and what we do into, in surgery. But here's actually an anatomic um, specimen, and you can see over here that the femoral head and the acetabulum fit together very nicely, the head fitting here, and here you can see the inverted labrum and how this head becomes distorted. So this is the main reason why you try to pick up hip dislocation early to prevent these deformities. The way that you're going to see this six months of age, and hopefully you see them a lot early and do the ultrasound, but six months of age, you look at the acetabulum index, and I'll draw your attention to the 30 degrees is what you want the acetabulum index to be at birth and 20 degrees by two years of age. And simply you draw a line through the triradiate, you draw a line from the triradiate to the superior lateral aspect of the acetabulum, and then you go ahead and you see what the, that angle is. And it should be about 30 degrees and you'd like to see the lateral aspect of the acetabulum superiorly, fairly sharp. 
You can also look at Shetland Flying, which is an easier thing to sort of look at. It's intuitive. You just see the arc between the femoral neck and the obturator, and that should be nice and smooth when it's disrupted, as you see over here. That means the hip is dislocated. And then also, if you draw a Hilger Reiner's line, which is through the triradic cartilage, and then drop a perpendicular line that's aligned with the lateral aspect of the acetabulum, you want to see that the femoral head is in the lower inner quadrant as opposed to the outer quadrants of the, those lines. And here's what would be a typical x-ray of a six-month-old where one femoral head is ossified, the other isn't. And you can see how the acetabulum index on one side is a little bit higher than the imaginary femoral head. One is on your uh, left side, you'll see that it's inside the lower quadrant, and on the right side, it's outside the lower the, uh, quadrants. And this is Dr. Grissom, and give your mentors due. As they say, I stand on the shoulders of the giants. That's why I see so far. She was uh, down at DuPont and uh, was uh, with Dr. Harkey and taught me how to do hip ultrasounds, and uh, I, I thank her for that. So ultrasounds are good from six weeks to six months of life and best performed in the office. We do this now in our office, and it's nice because you get the dynamic component. You can see actually the femoral head relative to the acetabulum, so you can see where the femoral head is in relationship, and actually you can see that safe zone and when it's seated nicely, and you can do pallet adjustments uh, to make the hip seat in the maximum position. So it's three-dimensional. It can be dynamic and visualize into the soft tissues. Here you can see quickly the femoral neck head and the acetabulum on the left, and then you can see the image on the right where here's the neck and the head sitting nicely. And so this is Dr. Graff, and this is actually Dr. Graff's hands in his famous paper, but his was static, and they looked at the alpha angle, and the number that you're looking at is you'd like it to be less than 60 degrees. It's a little complicated when you look at this. It is a little bit subjective, and again, I am a little bit prejudiced because uh, Dr. Harkey talked to me. Dr. Harkey showed that there's a dynamic component, so you can look at the various different uh, aspects of the uh, hip from different angles and also see it in motion. And so there's various different uh, uh, positions that you put the transducer on the hip and you do the Ortolani and Barlow basically and see how the femoral head moves in relationship to the acetabulum. And here's Dr. Harkey and Dr. Graff, who finally in 1998, the American Academy uh, of Radiology agreed to accept both their measurements. Uh, and uh, so they were always great friends and it was great to watch the debate. And here you can just see the hip ultrasound uh, here's the femoral head uh, on a pictorial, and here's the femoral head over here with the acetabulum, and you would like to see that half the femoral head is within the acetabulum. And here you can see where it becomes this plastic and can be moving, and again, this is not a talk on ultrasound, but you can clearly see that the three pictures inferiorly demonstrate the femoral head in relationship differently to the acetabulum, and you can make clinical judgments. So the treatment is tablet harness. Uh, and spica cast. There are other treatment forms in the past which have been eliminated. And all the paddle cornice does is has flexion straps which limit the extension. And then you have abduction straps which limit abduction. And so you're keeping the femoral head in the safe zone. You do have to be careful because with the uh, paddle cornice, you can get femoral nerve palsy, avascular necrosis, and costivalgia if you do not know how to use this. And I thank God over 30 years I've never had one of these complications, but you do know how to do have to know how to use the pallet harness to avoid this. And here is where you see these are the femoral heads, and that's the lateral circumflex artery that could be pinched if you hyperflex or hyperabduct the hips uh, in trying to get them seated. And the treatment after if the pallet harness is not successful, you can do the adductor tenotomy, and that gives you a larger safe zone. And then if that doesn't work, you can put spica caps on to hold the femoral heads in the proper position relative to the acetabulum. Sometimes we'll have to go ahead, and if there's obstruction like you saw on the previous slides, that you have to actually open up the hip and remove the ligaments and teres and get the femoral head seated in the acetabulum. And then there's pelvic osteotomies, which is a slew of uh, different osteotomies, and I was very fortunate to have Dr. Pizzatillo uh, invite me to the Chicago course in which all the masters came one year. I still treasure that tape in which they taught their osteotomies to us. And so that, again, this goes beyond the scope, but there are osteotomies and there's ways of reconstructing the hips to make sure that they get anatomically correct. Lastly, it looks like a complicated slide, but this has not changed in 30 years. If a child has a normal exam and is breached, we do ultrasound at six weeks, so we're all the way to the left of the slide. 
is six weeks uh, uh, ultrasound, 12 week ultrasound and x ray at six months. And if everything looks good, they discharge, the Dr. Mubarak's work. If they have a normal exam and put a history of protocols, metatarsis, or family history, it's an ultrasound at six weeks. If it's normal, they discharge. If they do have a Barlow and Ortolani, they treat it in the harness, and this is the treatment options. And then if it's an irreducible hip, when you start with a pavlic harness to get it reduced, you try it for three weeks, and if it does not reduce, you can remove the harness, orthogram, and generally do an open reduction. For the older children, from six to 18 months, you use a closed reduction of anesthesia with Spica. You can see here from 12 to 18 months, you sometimes will do an open reduction. 24 months, you'll generally add a femoral shortening. And at three to eight years, you'll do the, the same open reduction femoral shortening with pelvic osteotomy. And then after eight years of age, which would be quite rare in the United States, but sometimes if it's unilaterally, you'll replace it. If it's bilateral, you wait until the child's older and do reconstructive procedures. So the treatment has not changed in 30 years. This is what I learned during my fellowship. Uh, ultrasound is a little bit more readily available and accepted. I used to have to come to the hospital and do it myself since the, the ultrasonographer at the time would not do it for me. Uh, the clinical exam has improved. Uh, I used to do a lot of hip surgery and now after beating up on some of the residents who have now become attending, doing a great job. So generally what we do is when we see hips, we treat them with palicarnas. So I wanna thank you and thank you, Ellen. And I appreciate uh, everybody's time. And if you have questions, please feel free.